Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you've been sitting in the back row, or you are new here, and you are enjoying what you are listening to, please consider hitting that subscribe button, and make sure that bell icon is set to all, that way you don't miss a single upload of mine. Also, if you enjoy what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee, or if you'd like to learn how to become a member of the channel, all of that information can be found down in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepared for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Unsolved. Right after this intro, an ad will play. Right before I read the first case, an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Caution, some of these cases may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. Joey Moss, real name, Dubenian Joseph Moss, nicknames Joey or Dubby, location, Orlando, Florida, date, November 30th, 1990, bio, occupation, student, date of birth, July 2nd, 1985, height, 3'8", weight, 45 pounds, marital status, single, characteristics, white male with brown eyes, brown hair, and a freckled birthmark on his left eyebrow. The case. Details. In October 1990, 33-year-old Kathy Alter filmed her five-year-old son Joey, who had just learned to swim. One year later, the video is all she has left of him. On November 30th, 1990, he was abducted by his 36-year-old father, Jerry Moss. He has not seen Kathy for more than a year and does not even know that he has an 11-month-old baby sister named Elizabeth. Kathy and Jerry met in 1983. She had just finished nursing school. He was a bricklayer working in New York City and commuting home to the suburbs. She recalled that he had a very strong personality. When he was in a good mood, he was the life of the party. He was very intelligent and seemed very confident in himself. In 1984, she found out she was pregnant. She moved in with him. But for him, marriage was out of the question. When Kathy and Jerry started living together, he set guidelines of how he wanted things to go in the relationship and, of course, the household. He wanted as much freedom as possible as if he were a bachelor. As a result, she never knew what time he would come home. Although he would get off the train at 7 p.m., there were times that he would not come home until about 11 p.m. He would never call or consider what she was going through. On one occasion, when Jerry came home late, he asked where his dinner was. Kathy told him it was ready hours ago when he was supposed to have been home. He told her that he had stopped at a bar with his friends. She asked if he could just call to let her know he would be late. He became angry, saying that he did not need permission to go out and that he worked so hard, so he should have a warm meal when he comes home. He then demanded her to make a new dinner. On July 2nd, 1985, Kathy gave birth to a son, Jerry named him Dominion Joseph after one of his favorite football stars, Albert Dominion. Jerry's nickname for him was Dubby. According to Kathy, Jerry paid the rent. She alone was responsible for all of Joey's expenses. She began to work the evening shift as a recovery room nurse. During the summer of 1987, she took on the added burden of painting and remodeling the kitchen. One day, she came home from work, walked in the kitchen, and found a message from Jerry written in red crayon 
on the wall saying, get more baby bottles. She was furious since she had spent all that time working on the kitchen. She felt as if he was saying that he did not care about anything she did. Kathy had had enough. Jerry had not spoken to her in weeks. In late August 1987, she took Jerry and left. She found an apartment in Verlank, New York, 12 miles away. A few months later, she began dating a medical student named Mike Alter. In 1988, when he was in his last semester at medical school, he and Kathy got married. Joey was the ring bearer. Mike had been accepted into the residency program in Orlando, Florida. Jerry fought to obtain a restraining order, barring Kathy and taking Joey out of New York. Mike did not want to replace Jerry's role as Joey's father. He just wanted to be an important part of Joey's life. However, nothing they had to offer suited Jerry. He only wanted what he wanted and would not have any part of any compromise. If it was not his way, it was no way. In the end, Jerry's court bid was unsuccessful. According to Mike and Kathy, he began to harass them with phone calls in the middle of the night. Undeterred, Mike, Kathy, and Joey moved to Orlando in June 1990. By then, Kathy was pregnant again. Joey appeared to be thriving in Orlando. Then, just two months after the move, she received a surprise phone call from Jerry. He announced that he had moved here too. At first, she was a bit leery about it. They had just escaped his badgering and harassment in the court case, and they were happy to get away from it. On the other hand, they were hoping that it would be a positive thing for Joey. Jerry arrived in Orlando on October 4th, 1990. He rented an apartment just two miles from Mike and Kathy's house. He told them that he had accepted his loss in court and was just going to make do with the situation. They were happy because it seemed like things were going to work out for everyone. They let Jerry have Joey for long periods of time. They did not put any restrictions on his visit. On Friday, November 30th, 1990, Jerry picked up Joey at school for his regular weekend visit. Later, some teachers and parents remembered that his pickup truck was full of household items. The following Sunday, he did not bring Joey home. They had vanished. Kathy was, of course, devastated that Joey had been abducted. She always had it in the back of her mind that it could happen one day, but she never really thought that it would. Five months after Joey and Jerry disappeared, a missing children's agency in Seattle received an anonymous call. The caller claimed to be a friend of Jerry's. However, the agency suspected that it was Jerry himself who made the call. He said that Joey was okay and that he was sorry that things happened the way they did. He then said that they were going to California the next day. When the agency employee asked for more information, he became belligerent, saying that he, quote, was tired of fathers getting the short end of the stick in these situations. He also said that Kathy should have not taken Joey to Orlando in the first place. Police were unable to determine exactly where the call was placed from. However, they believed it occurred on the West Coast. They also believed that Jerry had no intention of returning Joey to Kathy. At Christmas and on Joey's sixth birthday, Kathy and Mike wrapped presents and put them in his room. Although there have been no leads since the Seattle phone call, they hope that he will soon be back home. Kathy said that what she has gone through is a mother's worst nightmare, not knowing where he is and if he is okay. Every day, she helps children in the recovery room around his age. She wonders if he is going through the same thing. The state of Florida has issued a warrant for Jerry's arrest 
on charges of interfering with parental custody. The authorities believe he is most likely to be in New York or the West Coast. Suspects, Jerry Moss, Extra Notes. This case first aired on December 4th, 1991 episode. It was updated on the February 19th, 1992 episode. It was featured on the show after an article was released by Ladies Home Journal about it. It was excluded from the film rise release of the Robert Stack episodes. Results solved. On December 3, 1991, before this case even aired, Jerry was arrested in Socorro, New Mexico. Viewers had recognized his photograph on a promotional announcement for Unsolved Mysteries. One viewer told authorities where he and Joey were living and that they were using the names Jerry and Mark staggered. When authorities arrived at their home, they found Jerry packing his belongings as he had also seen the promo. He told police that he was tired of running and glad that it was over. Joey was immediately placed in protective custody and Kathy was informed that he had been found safe. The next day, Kathy, Mike, and their 11-month-old daughter, Elizabeth, arrived in Albuquerque, New Mexico and were finally reunited with Joey. The reunion was made even more special when he was introduced to Elizabeth for the first time. Kathy was happy to see him, hold him, and have him back after all this time. He returned home to Orlando and began to readjust to life with Kathy, Mike, and Elizabeth. Today, Joey is a doctor living in Alaska. Additional Notes Missing August 19, 1991 Found August 5th, 1991, Dr. Joseph Moss is what he goes by now in Palmer, Alaska. Dorothy Allison, real name, Dorothy Margaret Allison. Occupation, psychic detective. Place of birth, Jersey City, New Jersey. Date of birth, February 29, 1924. Location, Nutley, New Jersey. History. Background. Dorothy Allison, a housewife and a psychic from Nutley, New Jersey, has assisted police departments in hundreds of investigations. The authorities believe her abilities are genuine and have been amazing at the details she has come up with for their cases. Sergeant Don Vaccaro of the Nutley Police Department said that seeing Dorothy's predictions come true was the most awesome thing that has ever happened to him. Dorothy has lived in New Jersey all of her life. She has four children and her husband, Bob. He's an engineer for a construction company in Manhattan, New York. When she was 14, she had the first indication of her psychic abilities when she had a vision of her apparently healthy father's death. In the vision, she saw a mourning wreath on the front door. Three days later, he died of pneumonia. Dorothy was understandably upset when her prediction came true. She believed her abilities were evil. However, her mother, who was also psychic, told her she had a gift. She said Dorothy did not need to worry and would not always see bad things. She said Dorothy would go far with her talent, but told her not to use it for profit. Dorothy's mother also warned her that she needed to be courageous enough to stand alone and stay strong in the face of skepticism. Despite her mother's reassurances, Dorothy spent years wishing she did not have her abilities. At one point, she became a parlor psychic and read people's futures. Then, in 1967, Dorothy had a detailed dream about a five-year-old named Michael Kirksix, who had disappeared after falling into a creek in Nutley. 
She went to the police and accurately described his clothing and the area where his body was later found. Following her accurate prediction, the police departments contacted her, asking for help solving tons and tons of cases. Since the Kirksix investigation, most of Dorothy's cases have been homicides, and many of the victims have been children. She often keeps photographs of the victims and stays in touch with their families. Dorothy has often thought, why does this happen to me? Why not anyone else? It has been hard on her emotionally and physically. She even quit for three years because it was so difficult for her. However, she has since learned to accept her abilities because she knows they can help people. She often prays to God, asking for help. She also wears a medallion of St. Anthony, protector of the lost and found. Dorothy describes her psychic abilities as being like turning on a TV and getting a picture in her mind. Sometimes they are in color, but other times they are in black and white. She sees the past, present, and future all together. Sometimes her visions are fast moving, jumbled, and difficult to decipher. She describes it as a kaleidoscope of pictures in her mind. Her visions occur both when she is asleep and when she is awake. In Dorothy's visions, she has seen victims, the location of their bodies, and even their killers. When working on murder cases, she often sees the crime occur and smells the odors from the scene. To try and provoke a vision, she likes to go to victims' homes and touch items belonging to them. She uses their pictures to help pinpoint their location. She looks through crime scene photographs to help visualize the crimes. She also develops astrological charts for people connected to the cases. Dorothy works 18 hours a day out of her kitchen. She handles at least 30 cases at a time. Sometimes she works over the phone. Oftentimes, she goes with the police to the crime scene. Dorothy is called almost daily by detectives and family members of missing persons. Although she has never paid for her work, other than travel expenses, she has been asked to help in hundreds of investigations. She has traveled across the United States and amassed dozens of certificates, letters of appreciation, and honorary badges from police departments for her help. After Dorothy helped with the John DeMars case, Detective Saul Lubertazzi of the Nutley Police Department volunteered to become her liaison with other police departments. He screens every request for help and explains how she works. He also helps interpret her visions. His wife, Phyllis, sorts the mail and answers letters. The use of psychics in police work is almost always controversial. Frequently, they are inaccurate. All too often, they are charlatans. But there are a few who do indeed seem to have a special gift, the unexplainable ability to predict details still locked in the future. Dorothy claims to have helped solve 90% of the cases she has worked on and helped find more than 100 missing people. She has predicted where bodies would be found, what happened to the victims, and even when they would be discovered. She also claims to have helped the police solve over 20 murders. Once, Dorothy warned a police officer that his daughter was going to commit suicide, which she later did. In another case, she told a beautician that one of her clients was going to commit suicide. She described the woman and said she often held a religious object. After the suicide occurred, the woman's parents asked Dorothy about the object. She said it was in the woman's jewelry box. The parents went to the box, and there it lay. On another occasion, Dorothy predicted the exact time and location where a man would hang himself. In one murder case, 
she accurately described the murder weapon, a round type of television wire, the area where the body was taken after the murder, the area where the body was found, the condition of the body when found, and the suspect's occupation. In another case, she accurately predicted that a missing 14-year-old boy from Maryland would be found working as a cook in California. In many cases, Dorothy's success has been astonishing, but over the years, she has worked on hundreds of investigations, and in many, she was unable to come up with the information that helped the authorities. Dorothy admits that there have been many times that she has struck out completely. There were cases when she wanted to find a child and did not come up with any clues or answers. She does not know why this happens. In March 1988, Unsolved Mysteries looked for a case where they would examine Dorothy's abilities. They found the murder of Lori Zimmerman in Hagerstown, Maryland, where the police are at a dead end. The police agreed to let Dorothy assist in the case and have the show film the investigation as it happened. They gave her no information about the case. They wanted to see if she could give them new information to help identify Lori's killer. Here are some of those case files she has assisted with. Michael Kirksix, Robert Kennedy. In April 1968, Dorothy told Sergeant Vaccaro that either Robert or his brother Ted was going to get shot. She said it would happen very soon and in a place far from Jersey. She saw an Arab or Indian man who was a stowaway on a ship. She believed he would be involved in the shooting. Less than two months later, on June 5th, Serban Serban assassinated Robert in Los Angeles, California. Patty Hurst. In February 1974, Patty was kidnapped by the Sabianese Liberation Army. Dorothy saw Patty in a mall, closet-sized space without light. She saw Patty's hair dyed red. She later saw Patty in Pennsylvania and in New York City. She also saw her joining her captors in robbing a bank. All of these predictions came true. Richard Weiler and Albert Settler. In 1974, Richard and Albert disappeared while flying a small plane. Dorothy accurately predicted that they would be found in a wooded area on December 9, 1974, and predicted some details about the crash site. Doreen Carlucci and Joanne Delardo. On December 13, 1974, Doreen and Joanne disappeared from Woodbridge, New Jersey. Dorothy saw the words silver and mead. The girls' bodies were later found near the Silver Mead trailer camp. John DeMars, Elsie and Robert Hall. On March 20, 1975, Elsie and her brother Robert were abducted after leaving their home in Union City, New Jersey. Dorothy accurately predicted that they had been sexually assaulted, strangled, tied up, and thrown in a marsh. She said their bodies would be found near a railroad, twin towers, and a burlap bag with red lettering resting on a pile of straw. She said the area had a strong smell of horse manure. Their bodies would later be found 50 feet from the described area. She also accurately described the killer's face to a sketch artist before the murders even took place. Finally, she took the police to the cemetery where the siblings would later be buried. Suzanne Jacobson Debbie Klein On July 22, 1976, Debbie disappeared from Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. Dorothy told the police that they would find Debbie's body sitting up, wrapped in a swimming pool cover with her throat slit, near a sign that said, Burnt on it. She also gave the police a composite sketch of her killer and said his first and middle names were Richard Lee. A few days later, Richard Lee Dodson 
was arrested and led police to Debbie's body. Everything that Dorothy had described about the scene was accurate. Son of Sam. Dorothy gave an accurate description of David Berkowitz and correctly predicted he would be picked up on a traffic violation. Ronald Steikoff. On September 22, 1979, Ronald disappeared from Lodi, New Jersey. Dorothy saw a blue car, the word Eclipse, a swampy area, and an airport. Ronald's body was later found in a swamp. Nearby was a fragment of a blue car, a bowling alley called Eclipse, and Teterboro Airport. The chief detective said she took them within 50 yards of the body. Atlanta Child Murders Between 1979 and 1981, at least 30 black men and boys were murdered in Atlanta, Georgia. Dorothy told the police the killer was a black male, a bully who was angry about being poor. She later claimed she identified Wayne Williams a year before the murders. Russell Keller on October 22, 1981, Russell was murdered in South Dakota. After Dorothy met with Russell's father-in-law, she said, Don't look any farther. He's involved. He later confessed to being involved in the crime. Lori Zimmerman, schoolgirl killer. During the late 1980s and early 1990s, several women were raped and or murdered in Scarlesboro, Ontario, Canada. Dorothy had visions of one woman being murdered, dismembered, and encased in cement. She also had a vision of another woman being abducted and murdered. As it turned out, these visions occurred before the murders even happened. These cases were later linked to Paul Bernardo and Carla Amalco and the details from Dorothy's visions were found to be accurate. Pardon me if I slaughter the next names. I don't know um, what language to speak here, so I'm just going to take a stab at it. Eliberto Aquino and Elazar Guevas. In March 1993, Eliberto and Elazar disappeared while fishing in New Jersey. Dorothy saw them in a river and also saw a junkyard and the name Robert. They launched their boat from Robert Street, and their bodies were later found near a junkyard. Sean Benet, Ramsey. Dorothy created a sketch of the suspect. Note. This case originally aired on the May 6, 1988 special number 6 episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Dorothy was also featured on Unsolved Mysteries, Psychic Investigators, Secrets of the Unknown, The Phil Donahue Show, and The Sally Jesse Raphael Show. Dorothy was referenced on an episode of Dateline, which focused on the disappearance and death of Timmy Wiltsey. Dorothy published the book, A Psychic Story, about her psychic abilities. Police departments nationwide sent affidavits to Unsolved Mysteries attesting to Dorothy's psychic powers. Some sources state that Dorothy's father died hours, a day, or a few weeks after her prediction. Many skeptics, including James Randi and Joe Nickel, considered Dorothy a fraud. They were unable to find any proof that she helped find a body or identify a killer. Nickel describes her as a retrofitter, a psychic who throws out a lot of vague information and then says that they are correct when a few pieces of their information match evidence from the solved case. He also believes she may have gotten some information from the detectives or victim's family. Some of the stories surrounding Dorothy's cases have changed over time. For example, contemporary newspaper articles stated that Michael Kirksix was found in a pond by a man trying to find a spot to bury his cat. However, later reports incorrectly claim he was found in a pipe as a result of Dorothy's information. Some even state that she took the police to the pipe, and when they cut it open, they found Michael's body. 
Two detectives in Patterson, New Jersey, accused Dorothy of offering them money to say that she helped them find a body of eight-year-old Delvis Mateus. They claimed she had them on a wild goose chase, made about a dozen wrong predictions about the case, and did not help them find Delvis. They also said she asked them to give her a set of phony police reports that would indicate she helped solve the murder. She denied the accusations, claiming the detectives were professionally jealous of her. Other detectives have also said that although she had some accurate clues, Dorothy has not helped them solve any cases. They noted that her clues were too vague and profuse to pursue. One detective in the Ronald Sticker case claimed that she did not help them find Ronald's body, even though she said otherwise. The police investigating the Atlanta child murders said she gave them 42 possible names, and none were helpful. Also, the police investigating the disappearance of the Clinton Avenue Five in Newark, New Jersey, said she led them to a field near Newark Airport. However, nothing was found. Dorothy continued working as a psychic for the rest of her life. In total, she worked on more than 5,000 cases around the world. She claimed to have helped the police find 250 bodies and solve hundreds of murders. On December 1, 1999, she died of heart failure at the age of 74. She allegedly predicted her own death telling her family in 1990 that she would not live to be 75 and telling them earlier in 1999 that she would not live to see her next birthday. Tom Young, real name Thomas Tom Young. Case, suspicious death, location, Silver Plume, Colorado. Date, September 7, 1987. Case. Details. Tom Young owned a bookstore in the small town of Silver Plume, Colorado. By 1987, he had done so for about a year. On September 7th, he closed it up and then disappeared along with his dog, Gus. He told the people that he was going on a trip to Europe. So... Three weeks later went by before anyone suspected that his absence was suspicious. On June 1988, 48-year-old Chicago sports reporter Keith Reinhardt began a three-month sabbatical in Silver Plume. His goals were to get into shape by mountain climbing, overcoming his fear of heights, and beginning to write his novel. His old friend, Ted Parker, ran a cafe in Silver Plume. During his sabbatical, Keith wanted to try running an antique store geared toward summer tourists. If it was successful, he hoped that he and his wife, Carolyn, could relocate there permanently. Keith and Todd had grown up across the street from each other and had known each other for almost 40 years. Ted felt that their relationship was similar to that of brothers, according to Ted. Keith was both apprehensive and excited about turning 50. He had come to Silver Plume to finish out the last of his 40s in the way that he had always dreamed of. According to his son, Spin, he had felt that he was going to get old soon and wanted to enjoy the last years of his younger life without any regrets. He also wanted to do certain things in his life before... He became too old to be able to do them. Keith's antique store was located on Main Street, across the street from Ted's Cafe. He soon learned that the building it was in used to be Tom's bookstore. He became obsessed with this mysterious disappearance. He began talking to everyone in Silver Plum who had known him. He tried to base the novel he was going to write on him. When he began the novel, he created a character named Guy Gibson, who was a composite of himself and Tom. Sometimes it seemed hard for people to tell the difference. His daughter Tiffany recalled 
that he was very interested in Tom's disappearance and talked about him all the time. She noted that writers like to live in the story that they are writing about and get a feeling of it so it is easier for them to write about it. She speculated that he may have wanted to feel what it was like to disappear so that he could write about it. On July 31, 1988, 10 months after Tom vanished, two hunters exploring in a Republican mountain just one and a half miles outside of Silver Plume found the remains of him and Gus. Each had died from a bullet wound to the head. A revolver was also found at the scene. In subsequent investigation, police found out that Tom had purchased a gun approximately four days before he vanished from Silver Plume. His case was later closed. It was ruled a homicide, both by the coroner's office and the Clear Creek County Sheriff's Department. One week later, on August 7, 1988, Keith closed up his store at about 2.30 p.m. Throughout the afternoon, he walked through Silver Plume and told several residents that he was planning to climb to the top of nearby Pandleton Mountain. Most did not take him seriously, knowing that he had a fear of heights and disliked climbing alone. At 4 p.m., he went to Ted's cafe and told him that he was going to climb to the top of that mountain. He also said that if he did not come back, he should call on the rescue. He then said goodbye and left. Ted also did not take him seriously. Keith was last seen walking toward Pendleton Mountain. It was around 4.30 p.m., much too light to begin a difficult climb that would normally take six hours. He had no jacket, only a flannel shirt. He also carried absolutely no supplies. That's right, he did not return. That night, he did not return. The next day, helicopters were called out to search Pendleton Mountain. On the ground, more than 125 men and a dozen trained dogs combed the difficult terrain for seven days. Searchers felt like it was very proverbial, needle in a haystack, with the latter being 3,000 vertical feet of 60 degree slope. It was about as difficult searching terrain that they had ever covered. They were also at a disadvantage because Keith had gone into the mountains wearing no more than blue jeans, a flannel shirt, and tennis shoes. He had no backpack or equipment for them to look for. Overall, he had left behind no clues for them. In 30 years of operation, the Colorado Alpine Rescue Teams have found every single person they have searched for. However, they have no trace of Keith. Friends later found a newspaper next to his computer. The headline read, Tom Young's body found. Still in the computer were these words, part of an unfinished novel. Quote, Guy Gibson changed into some hiking boots and donned a heavy flannel shirt. He understood Tom now and his motivation. Guy closed the door, then walked off toward the lush, shadowless Colorado forest above. End quote. Could these words imply that Keith, like Tom, had decided to just take his own life? Carolyn did not think that he would ever have considered suicide because he was a very optimistic, upbeat person. His advice to her was always positive mental attitude. With this type of personality, she felt that he would not have committed suicide. Another theory suggests that either Keith or Tom committed suicide, but instead were victims of foul play. First, ballistics could never prove that the bullet that killed Tom came from his own gun. Second, both rented exactly the same space to run the shops. They both may have come across information someone did not want them to have. Tiffany believed that foul play was involved and that Keith had stumbled upon something. Spin 
does not believe that they will find out the truth until Keith or his body is found. A final theory was that Keith planned his own disappearance. Carolyn does not believe that he would have left at 4 p.m. for a long-distance hike with a far destination in mind. At that time of day, she believed that he would have gone out for a walk up the mountain as far as he felt comfortable and then turned around and came back down. She thought it was odd that he did not take either of his cameras with him. He was in the habit of carrying his camera, especially with the scenery there. Police noted that Keith was possibly having a midlife crisis, was frustrated that he could not make it off his antique store in Silver Plume, and had told so many people that he was going for a hike. They are not sure why he made the point with so many people that he was doing so. It also did not make sense why he would climb to the top of the mountain by himself if he had vertigo and a fear of heights. They noted that Tom left a false trail surrounding his disappearance. They wonder if Keith did the same thing. Carolyn, however does not believe that Keith would walk away from his life. He loved the people in his life and loved keeping in touch with them. She does not believe that he would have just left them all behind. However, she hopes that if he is still alive, that they could work out whatever reasons he had for disappearing. Realistically, she was prepared herself for the possibility that He is no longer alive. One interesting footstep to this case was that Keith had told several friends shortly before his disappearance that he had wanted to visit West Virginia. Also, the night before he vanished, he had attended a party where he had spent a great deal of time talking to a woman named either Greta or Gretchen, who was from Denver. Police believe that she may have information on his disappearance. As of yet, the authorities have been unable to determine what truly happened to Keith. Although Tom's case is considered closed, many wonder if his death is related to Keith's disappearance. Suspects Keith and Tom's family and friends believe that they discovered something related to the building that they shouldn't have discovered and that they were murdered as a result. Extra Notes This case first aired on January 30th, 1990. Results Unresolved Both the police and the coroner's office considered Tom's death a suicide. However, there is still speculation that he and Keith were both murdered. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to Solved, Volume 23. I wanted to cut this one a little short to see how you all feel about this new style of reading. Of course, I will be reading longer, but I would love your feedback on this one. Before I go any further, I'd like to give a very special shout-out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Me, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Love, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support of Back to Ashes. If there was no you, there would be no me and no vocal melatonin. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. In the meantime, please take care of yourself and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.